Assalamu alaikum, salam sejahtera, and a very, very good morning. Welcome to the ACAP Global Series University Presidents Forum in collaboration with Uni University Kebangsaan Malaysia titled Values Based Leadership in ASEAN Higher Education. Yang berbahagia Datuk Mansur Osman, Deputy Minister, Ministry of Higher Education, Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya, Director, Higher Education Leadership Academy, ACAP. Professor Dato Insinyur Dr. Muhammad Hamdi Abushuko, Vice Chancellor, University Kebangsaan, Malaysia. Professor Tan Eng Chai, President for National University of Singapore. Datin Dr. Anita Bizi Abdul Aziz, Vice Chancellor, University Brunei Darussalam. Professor Insinyur Panot Mulyono, Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. Mr. Daniel Abdurrahman, Press Secretary to Malaysia's Finance Minister, Ministry of Finance, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ACAP Global Series University Presidents Forum in collaboration with University Kebangsaan Malaysia with the theme Values Based in ASEAN Higher Education. Today, we are lucky to have gathered the leaders that are heading among the highest ranking education institutions within the ASEAN region. In establishing their position as the world-class universities, a strong leadership with a clear direction is required. Now, this webinar aims at discussing the high-performance culture within higher education institutions through value-based leadership. As the global economy is undergoing uncertain times and challenges, universities are expected to explore various avenues in dealing with these changes. There is a strong need of value-based leadership in determining clear directions and visions in facing the new frontier. Now, without further ado, let's welcome a pre-recorded speech by Yang Berbahagia Dato Mansur Osman, the Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Higher Education of Malaysia, to share his welcoming remarks. Professor Dr. Nadine bin Yahya, Director of ACAP, Panelist Professor Dr. Insinyur Dr. Muhammad Hamdi Abdul Syukur, Vice Chancellor, University of Bangsa and Malaysia, Malaysia, Professor Tan Eng Chai, President, National University of Singapore, Dati Dr. Anita Bela Abdul Aziz, Vice Chancellor, University of Brunei Darussalam, Professor Insinyur Panut Mulyono, Rector, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, Moderator, Mr. Daniel Abdul Rahman, Press Secretary to Malaysia's Finance Minister. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning. Dear all, warm greetings. Syukur Alhamdulillah that we are here today to listen to the renowned speakers from top universities in ASEAN to speak on value-based leadership in ASEAN higher education. I believe this prestigious event aims to bring university leaders together to share their experiences and thoughts on value-based leadership and what we can learn as a region to strengthen ourselves to make ASEAN higher education institution a prominent global force. And today, we are honored to be given the opportunity to gain insights from our four successful ASEAN higher education institution leaders who have shown us their strong leadership, clear vision, and perseverance can escalate ASEAN universities in the eyes of the world. Professor Tan Eng Chai, Professor Dato Insinia Dr. Muhammad Hamdi Abbasuko, Professor Insinia Panut Mulyono, and Datin Dr. Anita Bizek. We look forward to listening to all your success stories and how all of you have dealt with the challenges. I wish to personally thank you to those involved in assuring that the webinar is a success, particularly ACAP, the Higher Education Leadership Academy in collaboration with Sikh Bangsa Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this webinar is very timely as the world is currently challenged with global pandemic. In ensuring that we are able to manage the pandemic and what comes after the pandemic, education plays an important role. 
It is education that makes human beings to act their part in this world successfully. Education is a very important condition for the development of the holistic man and an important vehicle for accelerating the prosperity and well-being of humankind in all directions. The ultimate aim of education is nourishing, developing a socially acceptable and balanced personality, citizen for the nation, for the whole world. In Malaysia, we have embedded the philosophy of education in our Falsafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan or National Education Philosophy. Here comes the importance of value-based education which is inseparable from education. Such an education consists of man-making and character-building program, training of body, mind and soul, quest for integrating culture and technology, and hunt for that goal which liberates men from fear, inertia, and ignorance. It is the responsibility of the drivers of education institutions and policy makers to ensure that the true doors or the higher mission education goals can be achieved. As the world becomes increasingly interconnected through intricate networks in technology-laden environments, leadership has become exponentially more complex. Thus, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous context compounded by COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted long-held leadership constructs. Current and future leaders now require new skills to lead competently in this rapidly iterating ecosystem. A strong value-based leadership is required to establish value-based education and to ensure continuity and sustainability at the same time dealing with transformations and coping mechanisms to deal with the VUCA situation. Dear all, I would like to thank the organizers for this event, ACAP and UKM, for your collaboration in organizing this event. I was made to understand that there will be more global talk series in the pipeline and look forward to more of these collaborative efforts in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you will gain great insights from the knowledge imparted in today's webinar session. We hope that all of you are inspired and motivated through the success stories and struggles shared by this great higher education institution leaders of our ASEAN region. With that, I wish all of you a great time and may today's webinar be a successful one. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Yang Berbahagia Datuk, for the speech. It is true that in this trying time, the higher education institutions need to adapt to newer needs and challenges that comes along with time. We still want to remain relevant within the industry. Now, depending on where you are, we hope that this morning, this afternoon, or this night will be a fruitful event to get insights from among the top ASEAN leaders. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce the moderator for this webinar. Uh, Mr. Daniel Rahman is a press secretary to the Malaysia's finance minister. Currently, he is in the thick of action in the rolling out of Malaysia's various economic stimulus packages, Prihatin and Punjana, worth over 295 billion ringgit. Now, these packages are aimed at stimulating Malaysia's economy, which has been severely impacted by COVID-19. This includes various incentives to protect and support jobs, as well as an upskill and reskilling the people. Having started his career as a lawyer, Daniel has worked in policy, technology and education, serving both Malaysia's education and higher education ministries. An avid writer, he has been the columnist for The Star, Malaysia's number one English daily since 2014. Recently, he hosted his own television show on Bernama, where he interviewed CEOs, professors, social media influencers, and communications experts. In 2016, he was a U.S. State Department IVLP fellow and studied in the role of political communications with the electoral process. 
Mr. Diano is often invited to give talks and share his views on artificial intelligence and technology trends, media and fake news, as well as education and society. Daniel has a postgraduate degree in law from Oxford University. Now, I would like to um, invite Mr. Daniel. The floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Um, well, thank I you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Latif, for that kind introduction. I thought you were going to cut it and keep it a bit shorter. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank Deputy Dato YB Dato Mansa Othman, Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Education, for his pre-recorded speech. But very kind of him to share some insights on uh, leadership and development. Uh, Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya, the Director of the High Education Leadership Academy, our gracious um, co-host um, for today's event, and of course our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, um, leadership has been a constant feature in humankind's history since time immemorial. Some say even before taxes were invented. Uh, every religion, philosopher, and teacher speaks of leadership as a vital cog in the development of their followers, um, civilization, as well as learners. Uh, leadership fulfills an innate need within us to provide guidance, direction, and hope. Uh, John F. Kennedy former American president once said that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. Whereas in Islam, there's a hadith by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he said, every one of you is a shepherd and everyone is answerable to his flock. In the context of higher education, which we are speaking about today, values-based leadership is growing in importance, especially as the global community of learners faces unprecedented challenges due to COVID-19. And, you know, all of us know, almost every speech nowadays starts with, we live in unprecedented times. You know, and that's a quite a constant, right? So today with our distinguished panel of speakers, we will dissect what values-based leadership means in the context of these challenges and new norm, as well as within ASEAN higher education. Now, allow me to briefly introduce our esteemed panel of speakers. Um, I, I know their profiles are up on the website, um, but let me also share with the audience today some, some, info, some background. The first panelist is Professor Tan Eng Chai, President of the National University of Singapore. Hello, Professor Tan. How are you? Hi, morning. Morning. Great. So, Professor Tan was appointed as President of NUS on the 1st of January 2018. He's the university's fifth president and the 23rd leader to head Singapore's oldest higher education institution. Prof Tan is a passionate and award-winning educator, and he has pioneered many um, things at NUS, including the special the Special Program in Science, the University Scholars Program, the University Town Residential Program, the Great Free Year, which sounds very interesting, and Technology Enhanced Education. He was also president of the Singapore Mathematical Society, as well as the Southeast Asian Mathematical Society. Prof Tan, and this caught my eye, is a member of Singapore's Future Economic Council, which is tasked in driving the growth and transformation of the country's future economy. Perhaps I'll ask some questions on that a bit later. Prof Tan received the Public Administration Medal Gold at Singapore's National Day Award in 2014 for his outstanding contributions to education. He was awarded the Wilbur Lucius Cross Medal, which honors exceptional alumni in the areas of scholarship, teaching, academic administration, and public service by Yale University in 2018. Also in 2018, he was conferred the Honorary Doctor of Science from the University of Southampton uh, in recognition of his achievements as an innovative and exceptional teacher and as a distinguished and respected leader in academia. Prof Tan, it's very nice to have you with us here today. Thank you. It's my pleasure too. All right. And so our next panelist is, of course, our host for today's event, Professor Datu Insinia, Dr. Muhammad Hamdi Abdul Shuko. I will call him Prof Hamdi, the Vice Chancellor of University Kebangsaan Malaysia. He was appointed as Vice Chancellor of UKM on the 1st of January, 2019, and started his career at the University of Malaya in 1995. And at 2010, at the age of just 39, he was made a full professor. Prof. Famdi founded the Center of Advanced Manufacturing and Material Processing, and recently formed the Center for Research in Industry 4.0. Prof. Hamdi has devoted his career in nurturing research and innovation, and has mentored over 150 postgraduate students, particularly in the field of advanced manufacturing and material processing. To date, he has supervised 66 PhD students and has authored over 160 ISI journals with a H-index of 26. In his position, he has also held many leadership positions prior to becoming Vice Chancellor, including the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International, as well as the Dean of Engineering. 
in these leadership positions, he has strategized and marked transformation in academics, as well as always aimed to push the universities into the limelight at the international level. Um, hailing from the Southern Malaysian state of Muar Johor, Professor Hamdi received his engineering, bachelor's in engineering, in mechanical engineering uh, from the Imperial College London, with a master's in science in advanced manufacturing technology and system management from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. And his doctoral study was in the field of thin film coating for biomedical applications for which he was conferred the PhD by Kyoto University. In 2015-2016, Prof. Hamdi was a visiting professor at the University of California in Los Angeles. Prof. Hamdi, thank you so much for hosting us today and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is our next uh, member of the panel, Datin Dr. Anita Abdul Aziz. She's the Vice Chancellor of University Brunei Darussalam. Dr. Anita was appointed as Vice Chancellor of UBD on the 20th of January 2016. She is the seventh vice chancellor and the first female to head the university. Congratulations, doctor. Under Dr. Anita's leadership, new initiatives included the setting up of the Center for Lifelong Learning, the Institute for Data Analytics, FPT UBD Innovation Lab, the Bi Botanical Research Center, as well as UBD's first overseas campus, the UBD FPT Global Center in Da Nang, Vietnam. Dr. Anita also led UBD into its entry into the QS World University Rankings in 2017 and Times Higher Education Rankings in 2019. Prior to becoming the Vice Chancellor of UBD, Dr. Anita was Deputy Permanent Secretary of Higher Education at Brunei Darussalam's Ministry of Education, and she has held various senior positions at UBD, including Assistant Vice Chancellor and Vice President of Global Affairs, Education and Internationalization, as well as the Dean of Medicine. So Dr. Anita's background is actually as a clinical academic in the field of reproductive medicine and biology. Um, she's also an honorary professor of leadership at Swansea University, UK. Welcome, uh, Dr. Anita, and thanks for joining us today. I know the introductions are quite long, Thank but you. I would like to... Um, yeah, sorry? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. And our last panelist for me to introduce before we jump right into the um, questions, because I know there are a lot that we'd like to ask is Professor Panut Mulyono, the Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, or UGM. Professor Panut was appointed as Rector of UGM in 2017. Um, previously, he was the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, and he's a Professor of Energy Science in the field of Chemical Engineering System Optimization at Gajah Mada University. He's a graduate from Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan, in 1990, and obtained his doctorate at the same university in 1993. He serves as the expert board of UGM's Energy Studies Center and in the field of research has published extensively both locally and internationally. In addition to contributing to education and research, he also is very much active in community service activities, which is something that we'll explore a little bit later. In professional organizations, he's currently listed as a member of, profession of organizations such as the Indonesian Engineers Association, PII, and the Association of Chemical Engineers of Japan. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your hopefully brief introduction of all our speakers. I hope I didn't rush through. And um, so the forum will, the, the session will go on for about an hour and then we'll of course take Q&As from members of the audience. So please feel free to submit. Um, what we'd like, what I'd like to request from the panelists is to keep your answers crisp. And what we can do is we can have more interaction and feel free to also interact uh, with each other. And if I may begin, is uh, our panelists ready to start? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. So to start off with, um, I'd like to ask a very basic question, right? And perhaps Prof Tan, you can kick us off uh, with this. I, I noticed um, that on YouTube, there's a video where you say that all of your children are alumni of NUS. And I think what that suggests is you also subscribe to the values of NUS, which you as president have also molded. So could you share with us a little bit about the core values of your university? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Daniel, and good morning to everyone. Uh, first, let me uh, say uh, good morning to my good friends, uh, Professor Hamdi, Professor Anita, and Professor Panuk. Uh, it's really a privilege, and I thank Professor Hamdi for inviting me uh, to this uh, webinar. So this year, we celebrate NUS 115th uh, anniversary. Uh, our aspirations, uh, captured in our vision 
mission and values. Our mission, our vision is to be a leading global university shaping the future. And uh, our mission is actually pretty easy. Uh, it's predicated on three words, to educate, inspire, and transform. Uh, and very importantly, uh, the culture of the university uh, is shaped by its value system. And we have identified five values that are of critical importance to NUS, and they are innovation, resilience, excellence, respect, and integrity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Tan, for that opening sharing. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Professor Hamdi, uh, what about UKM's key core values um, that you espouse? Thank you very much, Daniel, and very good morning to all my colleagues uh, from the ASEAN universities. Uh, in UKM, we coin five values that we cherish. Number one is, uh, in, in, which we actually have an abbreviation called KAMI, and KAMI stands for K is Kesrakanan in Malay, in Malay language, which is oneness of UKM. We want everyone to actually subscribe to the idea that we are actually one, regardless of different faculties and institute. Secondly is accountability. We wish that everybody will be subscribing to the idea that if you have been given a job and a task, then you are accountable on whatever been given to you. And thirdly is merit, K-A-M. M is merit, means that we wish that everyone is doing things based on merit. We appoint someone, we, we uh, get a professor based on merit, not because of whom, whom we know, but rather exactly what the person can uh, establish and also contribute. And I, K-M-I-I, -I, I is innovation. Again, it's similar to NUS. We cherish and value uh, innovation. We wish everyone will subscribe to innovation. And eventually, the last one is integrity. We wish that integrity become, even though it's number five, but it's actually encapsulating the whole value system that we have. And it is actually the core of what we believe in. And this value of integrity is, is, is very, very important to UKM and it is becoming uh, the, the pillar for all the uh, values that we uh, have mentioned just now. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Professor Hamdi. And I'd like to move on like, straight to Dr. Anita. Can you share with us um, the core values of your university? Yeah, sure. But first of all, again, thank you very much to Professor Hamdi for the kind invitation to this platform. And it's also lovely to meet friends uh, from universities in ASEAN. Uh, usually we would meet at least once a year, at least in our AUN platform. So it's lovely to meet you this year, although it's virtually. Um, regarding values, um, we put a lot of emphasis on values. I think it's very important to have values in any organization. We also have five. Um, these values have been in UBD for many years and it's Pearl. Uh, P-E-A-R-L, and P is for people, so we put a lot of emphasis on people of the university, um, not just staff, but students as well, and the various levels of staff. So people is at the center of what we do. Um, e is expertise, um, so we put emphasis on expertise, but as well as enhance our expertise each time. Um, the third one is A for aptitude, um, so it's the ability to learn and adapt and solve problems. Um, R is relevant, so we want to maintain and be ahead as well of the fast-changing world. And the last one is L, which is leadership. So leadership is very important that we emphasize on developing leadership at the, every level of the university. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anita. We'll deep dive more into these uh, values uh, in a moment. Uh, I'd like to now get to Professor Panut. And Professor, same question to start us off. Uh, what are the key core values of your university? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, <coughs> Mr. Daniel. Uh, very good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, to meet a prominent leader uh, in the ASEAN uh, countries. Uh, and uh, special thanks addressed to Professor Hamdi 
uh, also Profesor Lati, Profesor Tan, Datin, uh, Dr. Anita. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, talking about uh, core values, uh, UGM has uh, two philosophical values and five identities. Uh, these two philosophical values are uh, Pancasila, the five principle, the national identity of Indonesia and uh, Indonesian culture. And the second one uh, is knowledge, reality, and trust. Uh, meanwhile, the UGM uh, five identities are uh, UGM as national university because uh, UGM is the first national university established by the government after we reach the independent. Uh, and the second is a struggle, a university, or in Bahasa uh, Indonesia, we call it as uh, Universitas Perjuangan. Uh, and the second, uh, and the third is UGM as uh, Pancasila University. Uh, this means uh, that uh, Universitas Gajah Mada uh, based on uh, Pancasila for uh, all of our uh, activities. And the fourth is uh, UGM as people, a university. And the last uh, is UGM as cultural center uh, university. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dania. All right. Thank you so much for that opening. I think what we've seen in this first round is just a very diverse set of principles. Um, you know, this nationalistic patriotism, there's integrity, there's excellence, there's aptitude, there's people, there's expertise, there's merit, innovation. I think it's quite wonderful to see kind of like the, the, the myriad. What I've also noticed quite interestingly is all the vice chancellors today seem to come from a science background. Um, and I'm just wondering, maybe we can start with Dr. Anita, who comes from, a, you know, medicine. Uh, and doctors usually they diagnose, you know, before they treat. Um, how has your sort of background uh, influenced that leadership style and the shaping of values? Um, I think not just my medical background. I think for mm -hmm. every person, um, your leadership is shaped by your journey. Um, so I think definitely my medical background has had an impact as well. Um, and I think especially the training and the various um, jobs, the rotations. Um, and I think what's important in one's journey that shapes your leadership style is actually your ups and downs. That means your troughs and your peaks. Um, and I think especially when you're on, at the down, which is your trough. Um, and I think what's very important, um, I think everyone's lives um, has got its ups and downs. And I think what's important is your learning points. So when you're at your lowest point is what are the things that you can reflect, what you can learn from, and how you can um, lift yourself from the trough. Um, and, and I think if you do that frequently, and I think your trust will be less frequent and will be less um, deep as well. Um, so I think everyone's leadership will be shaped by the journey, I think, from birth to up till now. But definitely, as you said, my medical background has certainly helped as well. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to Prof Hamdi. And when Dr. Anita mentioned about the ups and the downs and the journey, perhaps if you could share with us uh, some of the challenges that you kind of went through in part of you, as part of your journey and, to, and how that has shaped um, your leadership um, moving forward. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I look at myself as a quite a reluctant leader in the sense that, you know, um, being being a researcher, I enjoy doing research. I enjoy having my postgraduate students and, you know, getting grants and, and uh, doing, you know, whatever that researchers are doing. And when it comes to leadership, normally we tend not to accept, but we know that somebody has to do it. Therefore, it is a national service, if I may say. Um, I've been national in a leadership service. role, even though we are trying, I mean, I'm personally trying to not to accept it uh, uh, in, in various occasions, but fortunately, unfortunately, I'm, I'm uh, you know, kind of uh, forced into this position. For me, the most important thing is, as leaders in facing challenges is the sincerity. And um, it is very central to the leadership 
when uh, we are facing a lot of challenges nowadays. If the person is not sincere, a lot of things can't be executed well because there are lots of, sometimes, lots of uh, personal gain and personal agenda. In the context of Malaysia, for example, uh, a vice chancellor is appointed by the minister. And therefore, uh, maintaining the position is, is a prime important for some. Uh, and I do not see that uh, you know, in line with sincerity. So uh, sincerity is, is, again, is very important in being a leader in facing challenges. I think number two is uh, humility. Uh, we are managing peers in the university. We are not really hierarchical in nature, even though a vice chancellor is up there uh, at the peak of, of the uh, hierarchy. But truly, it's just peers that we are managing, professors who are our colleagues and our friends. And therefore, it's not the same as in the corporate, in my opinion. So humility is very important. And uh, looking at others, not as subordinates, but rather as peers that we have to respect, we have to listen to, we have to have lots of uh, patience in dealing with, because these are great people, great mind, and, and they are... You know, they are there because of, of their intelligence and, and greatness. So humility in the part of leaders are, are very important in facing such a group of people that they are leading. And thirdly, um, is all about quality. University is, is as good as the people that is in there, which are the professors, the, the professionals, and also the support staff. And we have to ensure that in whatever we do, it is the quality that is number one. In the context of UKM, we have established what we call as house of quality, where we have five elements, which is number one, if I may very quickly, number sure one is, the, is uh, research, quality in research, quality in education or academic, and third one, quality in internationalization, which is very important nowadays. And these three quality, house of quality, is supported by two pillars, which is talent, everybody who's in the system, and the fifth one is the uh, income generation, which is a challenge in Malaysia. For understanding the background in Malaysian university, uh, so these five pillars or five house of qualities have been erected uh, in order to ensure that we, we will uh, sail and face the challenges successfully. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I like the points on sincerity, humility, and quality. Um, traits often that can be missed because when you're in education, you're dealing with very intellectual people and you're a very prominent role in society. So always remembering your, your roots is very important. Um, on that, I'd like to move on to Prof Tan. Um, Prof, you know, uh, one thing about NUS is that it's always sort of seen as a leader within the ASEAN context. Um, what do you see as the challenges um, in raising the bar of higher education uh, from where you sit. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, uh, I think we have been quite uh, well ranked in the rankings, uh, but uh, I have always uh, advised my colleagues that uh, rankings only show a particular aspect of what the university does. And uh, it is a good guide, but it by no means show how good you really are, mm -hmm. right? So uh, this is very much related also to the humility that uh, Professor Hamdi talked about. Uh, that I think we are in an era of unprecedented changes, and it is important that we do not stand still. We must keep pressing ahead, whether it be to improve the quality of education, uh, to ensure that our graduates are better prepared uh, for the ever-changing and complex world, uh, or whether to improve our research so that we build more world-class research uh, in the university. I think these are very much on our concerns as well as on the concerns of all our top universities in ASEAN. Right? So we, I see a lot of similarities um, and I also see a lot of opportunities uh, that universities can work together. I think as a leader, I think a leader has to be dynamic and determined 
right? So dynamism is important. And of course, at the very base of it is again what Professor Hamdi said, that sincerity, right? If somebody has his or her personal agenda, then we have to be very careful because that person may put the interest, his or her interest before the university's interest, right? Our job is really uh, to move the university uh, and uh, personal interest sometimes can stand in the way, right? So that sincerity and genuineness uh, is very important. The other thing, again, related to what uh, Professor Hamdi had said, Universities is about talents. It's about our talented students, talented faculty members, talented staff, mm -hmm. talented alumni. All right, that's the whole university community. That's right. And uh, one thing that I believe very strongly is synergy. How do we synergize the talents across that different functionalities? be it admin, academic, research, uh, alumni and students. How do we synergize and having individuals and team work closely and collaboratively towards a common goal? Right? That, that would be uh, a big challenge. And I think this would be even more important in this rapidly changing an ever complex world and uh, with the numerous disruptions uh, and the huge challenges that face all of us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to point on talent, students, staff and faculty, as well as the synergy across the spectrum. Um, I'm going to go to Prof Panut now and I'd like to ask a question because in your profile you mentioned that you were also very much involved in community based service and activities. So as part of that synergy, Professor, what are your thoughts on the university's role in the context of the community? Okay, yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, the uh, university uh, has a very important uh, role uh, to the uh, community. Yeah, uh, and uh, the... <coughs> Uh, Universitas Gajah Mada has uh, do a lot uh, of thing with the uh, community uh, and uh, we uh, do uh, the community uh, service uh, for the uh, community and UGM uh, deployed thousands of uh, uh, students uh, all over the uh, Indonesia uh, and uh, they do a lot of uh, activity uh, to educate the people uh, in the remote area, uh, develop uh, all of the, uh, uh, for example, how to use uh, the uh, energy, develop the farming, uh, and <clears throat> so on. Uh, so uh, the impact of the uh, university to the community uh, should be uh, increased uh, uh, annually. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, UGM uh, has done a lot of the uh, SDGs, SDGs, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, SDGs, cool. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, until now, uh, we uh, do a lot of uh, community uh, services. And uh, also uh, in helping the uh, community in placing uh, COVID. Uh, now, uh, UGM has uh, uh, done a lot of uh, research and mm -hmm. produced a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> medical devices yeah, uh, okay. to help the uh, community in placing uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, <coughs> of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, role of the university uh, to the community is uh, very important. And uh, I think uh, the ASEAN University uh, already done uh, for this uh, area. 
Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So what we've done is around about a bit of your personal backgrounds and a bit of looking at this university as a community. Um, next, I'd like to ask a little bit about ASEAN and how the question goes is in moving forward, um, ASEAN universities are facing similar challenges to our Western counterparts. Uh, what are the areas of strength and what are the areas of improvement? Um, perhaps we can ask uh, Prof Hamdi to start off this part. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. It's a very thank good you. question. Looking at ASEAN, we have around 600 million people residing in that region and is a very fast growing region, probably one of the fastest in the world, uh, with the GDP much more than any other region. Mm -hmm. And these, these 600 million people in ASEAN, they are young, they are vibrant, and they work very hard. I think the strength of ASEAN is the collaboration, collaboration between these countries. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, peaceful uh, region in comparison to the rest. And uh, that's number one, very peaceful, uh, despite having multiracial and multi-religious and, and uh, multi-ethnic uh, countries uh, mainly. But we live uh, in harmony and, and uh, work together very well. We respect each other in terms of uh, each country members. Uh, so the peaceful is, uh, this people nature of, of ASEAN is, I think, the strength which we should leverage on. Secondly is the culture of ASEAN. Uh, it is well known all around the world that ASEAN people are very friendly. Uh, they are very uh, easy to go with and, and people are very nice in, in ASEAN. So due to this culture of ASEAN, I think we can attract lots of potential students from all over the world to come over to ASEAN countries. Mm -hmm. I think the third one is the focus of most of ASEAN uh, countries. They are focusing on education. We value, in, in ASEAN uh, region, we value education very strongly. And um, the emphasis and, and the, the money that we put in uh, by each country member, for example, is huge. And Malaysia put a huge amount of money into education, more than 60 billion of, of the uh, GDP, for example. Uh, and, and that is the largest allocation uh, in terms of distribution of, of the GDP. So the focus on education in, in most of ASEAN countries is heavy. And, and it shows that the uh, ASEAN uh, member countries are pushing in uh, for, for the uh, citizen to be educated. We have uh, much less uh, percentage of, of uh, people with degree, for example, in comparison mm -hmm. to the Western world. But right. the number is, is catching up very well. So all these three elements uh, of strength, I think, is where the ASEAN uh, countries has got the strength and should be, should be focused on. But we, at the same time, have got weaknesses as well, where we still have got a lot of talent uh, to build up. Uh, our talents are still young. Uh, and, and the way we are doing things, for example, in terms of the bureaucracy and the system, the process, I think a lot mm -hmm. of improvement need to be done there. We are not having full autonomy in, in comparison again with the Western world. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that we should strive towards, a greater autonomy within the higher education space? I believe so because if we look at the Western world, we look at America and England, for example, or the European mm -hmm. countries, the universities are very autonomous and, and they have huge uh, rights yeah, when they have this autonomy. And due to that, we can see university flourish, uh, stifling uh, autonomy by, by lots of bureaucratic uh, regulations and, and imposing rules and, and with, you know, whatever that the ministry wants. I think that, that probably hinder a little bit. So it is important to let go, uh, let the university go and flourish uh, because it has, been, it has been the case in, in many top universities in the world. Uh, I believe so that uh, we are to, uh, moving towards that, particularly for the uh, Malaysian government, for example. We have a blueprint to actually uh, release the university from, from uh, bureaucratic processes and let them be on their own. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. it is a process. It will be uh, getting there sooner or later. And we can see that by moving in that direction, uh, university uh, in Malaysia and in ASEAN, I think will we'll, uh, we'll flourish uh, even more. All right. Thank you so much, Prof, for those insights. Um, I'd like to ask, move on to Prof Tan and also ask him what 
can ASEAN offer to the wider education community um, based on you know where we are right now? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I fully agree with what uh, Dato Hamdi had uh, mentioned about ASEAN. Uh, the ASEAN universities are deeply connected to their communities and uh, they serve very important functions all right, of enhancing the manpower for their respective countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have uh, very local as well as global orientations, mm -hmm. uh, which are now needed since we are very much a global world, uh, mm -hmm. despite the recent tensions uh, between China and US. Uh, right. But I still think that uh, in itself, ASEAN, with 650 million people, mm -hmm. we have a tremendous pool of talents. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the ASEAN region uh, will grow mm -hmm. uh, and in fact it is one of the fastest growing area like what uh, Professor Hamdi has mentioned. But I will say that the growth uh, may not be evenly spread. All right. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I think there are growth in certain sectors but there's less growth. Uh, in uh, important sectors. So like, for instance, if you take the area of uh, emerging technologies, right. these are actually all uh, led by, I would say, China and the uh, US. Right. Rest, I think we do have tremendous talents in these areas, in digital technologies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, we are in a way catching up, right? And therein, I think, uh, there are some weaknesses within the ASEAN region. Uh, how well universities are connected to their local industries, mm -hmm. right? Because it means how well uh, the local as the graduates of the ASEAN universities articulate into the industries into the uh, markets that, that exist, right? Within. Because this right. is about employment, right. right? Employment of really the talents of the respective countries. Uh, you have to have an economy that has the capacity to absorb these talents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. uh, you also have to have the universities to make sure that they educate and train these graduates properly. Right to, into, uh, and so that they can articulate better into the industry. So that connection between industry and university will be one important uh, consideration. Uh, right. The other, the other mm -hmm. consideration is in terms of the support by the government. Okay. Uh, it is true that uh, all governments in ASEAN believes in the importance of education. Right. Uh, it is also true that uh, all governments are stretched uh, in terms of the resources that they could provide. Mm -hmm. But my sense is that uh, ASEAN universities would require a stronger level of support from, from their respective governments. Okay, that's interesting. All right, mm -hmm. and that, that, that is important. Uh, resources are important because it allows universities right, to build up their infrastructure to be able to hire and train very good people so that uh, the quality of these people uh, are sort of commensurate with those in top institutions elsewhere. Right. So this right. are the uh, Professor, if you, uh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I was going to say, if you could hold that thought, because we'll come back to the point on talent in a while. Uh, I'd like to quickly move on to Prof Panod and hmm. just ask him, because you know Indonesia has a huge population and a lot yeah. of youth, especially entering higher education. So Prof, what is your vision for UGM in terms of the development of Indonesian youth, also for the ASEAN region? Yes, uh, thank you, <coughs> uh, Dania. 
Ya, yeah. uh, not only for Indonesia, ya, yeah. for Indonesia of course, uh, we want to develop our universities in uh, Indonesia uh, to give uh, good or uh, best education to our uh, people. Uh, that's why the development of the university in Indonesia is uh, very important. Uh, so uh, we want uh, that uh, the uh, uh, graduate from junior or senior high school uh, as many as possible, as much as possible, uh, they enter to the uh, university. And now, uh, only about uh, 32% of our uh, high school graduate entering to the university. It is, uh, 32%? Huh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, 32, around 32%. So it is mm -hmm. uh, uh, the problem. Uh, so right. uh, we want to uh, increase uh, the number of uh, students uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, that's why uh, the quality uh, is uh, very important. Uh, mm. I think uh, in Indonesia, uh, the uh, problem about the university is uh, the quality of the uh, professor, the quality of the equipment or facilities. Uh, so it is uh, the job of the uh, government uh, to increase the quality of the uh, higher education in uh, Indonesia. And uh, in the case of uh, ASEAN country, uh, I believe that we can improve our uh, university uh, through collaboration, uh, strengthen our collaboration among the university in uh, ASEAN. And also we have to modernize uh, our uh, equipment, our technology, uh, and uh, also uh, make uh, uh, enough of the professor yeah uh, so if the quality of education uh, in uh, asian countries uh, become uh, better uh, we uh, sure that there will be a lot of people uh, coming to asian region uh, okay. to pursue uh, the does, yeah does ukm have a big um, international student population yes yes, yes like, How big? like ukm uh, if uh, we can do uh, this case, uh, I believe that uh, the university can accelerate the development and progress of the Asian countries. Yeah? Uh, so uh, we want to attract uh, a lot of students from all over the world coming to Asian countries to pursue their uh, education. Uh, to do that, uh, so the quality of education, the quality of uh, uh, universities in uh, ASEAN uh, must be improved uh, together. Thank you. Right. right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, I'd like to move on to Dr. Anita. And some of the points that I mentioned earlier was about government's role in providing support resources funding, as well as um, autonomy moving forward. And, you know, Dr. Anita, you were the um, Deputy Permanent Secretary of Higher Education uh, previously. Uh, what are your thoughts on this issue and how this impacts the university's ability to become a, a, a greater player within um, ASEAN and uh, the global community? Um, I totally agree with what has been said so far mm -hmm. with regards to autonomy. Um, I do feel it's a very important issue. Um, in Brunei, we have four universities and they're all public universities. Um, but at the moment, we're not fully autonomous. And I think it's similar to what Professor Hamdi was saying earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, although we are a stat board, um, but however, functionally, we're not fully autonomous yet. So I do agree um, that universities should be autonomous. And that's something that we're working on at the university. Um, so we've set up deadlines and our milestone on how we can achieve um, at least towards full autonomy. Um, and I think with full autonomy, with less bureaucracy, with more empowerment, um, and I think that will allow universities to develop um, significantly. Um, so yes, I do agree with that. Um, but like Professor Tan was saying earlier on, and I think with autonomy as well, uh, we do need continuous 
um, government um, support. Um, and especially during this COVID-19 period, and I think yeah. a lot of governments are very stretched um, in terms of funding. So that makes universities to be more corporate in nature as well. Um, right. So yes. we're looking to other sources of funding, and I think with um, a lot of collaborations with other stakeholders as well. Um, so coming back to your question, yes, um, and I think that's something that we as well, um, now I'm on the other side, but mm -hmm. we did agree with that as well when I was on the other side, and I think that's very important for universities. All right. Thank you. I, I like this. Um, so what we heard earlier, ladies and gentlemen, was about the role that ASEAN universities can play in terms of synergy as well as the challenges. And Dr. Anita also pointed out something very interesting, which is now we are all facing COVID-19 and its impact onto lives and livelihoods. Um, I'd like to stay with you, Dr. Anita, for the next question and to start us on this COVID-19 uh, segment. Um, so during these trying times, the universities have had to change and pivot in many ways, right, from teaching and learning to also internationalization. Could you share with us uh, some of the challenges that you have faced uh, and what is being done um, by the university to face them? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sure we have common challenges as well, not just within ASEAN, but across the world as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruda had its first COVID-19 case on the 9th of March. I remember that very clearly. Um, but within the, first, within the first three days of the first report of our COVID-19 case in Brunei, we went fully online. And I think that was possible. We were able to do it very quickly. And I think that was possible because we have been um, practicing blended learning for several years. Um, although the quick change did have some shock to some staff and students as well, uh, but we managed it within the first three days. So a lot of things went online, not just learning fully online, but our online assessment, our student services, um, staff had to be working from home with some with staggered attendance. Um, so we minimize our social contacts as much as possible. Uh, we put up QR codes at every building so that we could track um, people coming in out of buildings and so forth. But Alhamdulillah, I think we're very lucky in Brunei. The government has done very well. Um, so the COVID-19 situation is very well controlled. Mm -hmm. um, our borders are still closed. But Brunei at the moment is undergoing de-escalation um, stage, stages. rather. Um, so we're now going into blended learning. So we're now looking into moving forward. What, it, it, what is it for UBD? Um, so we've decided that we're going for structured blended learning okay. and that's the continuum. What does that mean? Which is more yep. students. Structured blended learning? Um, so initially in the past, we had blended learning, but it was more of um, optional. Some were doing it better than others. Right. Uh, but now because it is the norm for us, um, although we're on the escalation, um, there's still some lectures going fully online, especially the big classes. Uh, but this is bottom line is ensuring quality, um, quality in the curriculum, quality in our instructional um, delivery and so forth. So our blended learning is more structured. Um, we ensure that learning outcomes are met, mm -hmm. um, quality in the pedagogy, um, we get a lot of feedbacks from staff and students. Um, so this involves a lot of re unlearning and relearning for our mm -hmm. academic staff. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I just give an example because they're different because we don't sure. prescribe that staff needs to be doing one particular um, model. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, there would be, I mean, just very briefly because I don't want to take too much time explaining this. Um, so, for example, for big classes, um, they will be pre-recorded. So one module, for example, we pre-record um, the module um, right. and that would include, for example, they could put in graphs or some clips of videos, for example. So students can access to these videos anytime. So they can be doing it at home, in cafes, for example, <coughs> and they need to do this before they attend their face-to-face -face tutorials. Um, right. But some modules prior to having this face-to-face -face tutorials, um, they would have quizzes to test the student. Um, so, in, so this would allow professor to know how the whole class is performing. 
um, whether they understand the learning objectives and outcomes, um, and they will be able to pinpoint the weak students as well. So right. in that way, they may have a one-to-one -one or maybe smaller groups before the tutorials or around the time of tutorials. Um, right. So that's the kind of more structured to ensure, because we want to ensure that students are getting what they should get. They should be getting, they're getting, I mean, the take home is the learning objectives and learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we're restructuring our blended learning to make sure um, students are getting what they should be getting. Mm -hmm. um, but yes. We were talking about challenges and, and I think there will be commonalities, um, yes. but there are three things to challenges. One is our strategy. Mm. What is our strategy? Number two okay. is handling crisis, because there okay. were quite a number of crises. As we know, COVID-19 is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And the third one is the people factor. Okay. But handling strategy is very easy. Handling crisis is also easy to manage, but it's handling the people. people. And okay. you're handling your students, you're handling yeah. your staff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is adapting to the new norms. Like I was right. saying earlier, relearning for everyone. But yeah. what I would like to stress here, what's most important, I think, in handling people is communication, communication, communication. And I think right. it's having clear communication, regular, especially with the changes, and through different channels. We also have not only have feedbacks, we, we created a hotline phone as well uh, mm -hmm. for staff students right. and for public as well. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to move on because we can come back to this a little bit later because COVID is obviously a very interesting topic of discussion. Um, Prof Panut, if I could come to you very quickly because Indonesia with its large population, uh, what are the yeah. challenges that you have faced uh, at UGM in terms of handling with the crisis? Maybe if you can share three or four challenges and what the university has done. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, at the beginning uh, is uh the difficulties to make a de decision yeah uh, about the uh <coughs> lecturing and also community services uh, because uh, the pandemic come uh, on uh, ongoing semester uh, right, right. in march yeah right. and at the time uh, there are a lot of our students uh, in the field uh, for community services uh, and also uh, the uh, lecturing uh, most of the professors uh, like this to face uh, lecturing in the classroom even though before uh, pandemic was coming the regulation uh, in UGM is uh, until 40% of the content of the uh, lecture can be delivered uh, online uh, but most of the professor is uh, proper uh, to do face-to-face -face lecturing in the yeah. uh, in the classroom, mm -hmm. and the difficulties at the time is a lot of opinion. Uh, should we uh, switch uh, directly to the online system, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, should we withdraw uh, our students in the field uh, because of a pandemic? Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, opinion in the time. Right. Uh, what was what was decided then by, yes, by yes, you and the yes. team? Uh, I uh, invite and discuss with the dean of the faculty of uh, medicine and mm -hmm. also asking to the uh, expert in uh, health and pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. Then uh, I was decided uh, to switch to the online system for the lecturing and withdraw all the. A student uh, to come back to the Jakarta, uh, and uh, after that, uh, the difficult uh, problem is uh, about the the region. Is uh, should we uh, convert to the research funding uh, for right. the research uh, for the uh, pandemic uh, problem to face the pandemic problem, or uh, continue? Uh, uh, for the uh, initial or uh, for the uh, research already planned before the uh, the pandemic uh, was uh, was coming, and uh, after we discuss it, uh, some of the research topics should be switched to the uh, uh, pandemic uh, problem. Uh, so there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, problem of facing uh, by uh, the vector. 
a bath with the uh, discussion uh, with the colleagues, and then uh, we can uh, decide it uh, based on uh, our uh, discussion uh, with the experts. Thank right. you very much. Right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to Professor Prof Hamdi. And one of the things that Prof Panwit had, had mentioned was how COVID, as well as uh, Dr. Anita has, men has mentioned, how it's impacted research, learning, and you know, people and communication. How, what was your experience in UKM in sort of getting that shift to happen, um, whether it's online learning or whether it's maybe doing more research within the campus grounds and not really going to the field because of the limitations, um, if you could share with us. Thank you, Daniel. I, after a couple of months of this COVID, I think the experience gone through by most universities are very, very similar. Less number of students in campus. You don't have that many of international students coming over. Uh, our people have to work from home and, and we have to kind of agile, uh, being very agile in, in response, responding to the new environment. Uh, after a while, we become quite mature in our response. Uh, our SOP, standard operating procedures, are quite uh, matured as well. And we are com you know, comfortable with what we are doing now because we know how to handle the situation. Uh, I believe the response are very, very similar, just, just like mm -hmm. being mentioned by my colleagues just now. The only thing is that um, the question from the UKM side uh, and other universities in Malaysia particularly is the ability to attract the international students, which we are being, having momentum for a number of years. And now uh, we are suddenly you know, uh, seeing much, much less uh, people coming into our universities. Yeah. Um, the way I look at it is that uh, we, we transform uh, and, and, and find new ways of dealing with this. Uh, it, it is a blessing in these guys in a way. The, previously, people are, are reluctant in doing online teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, this banded learning is, is get, gaining traction slowly, but with COVID, uh, people are forced to actually go online and we have tons of material now that we can actually save in our system and, and we see new avenue that we can actually do uh, online distance learning. People cannot mm -hmm. come to our universities, but they can actually register and follow us uh, through online and virtually. And this has opened up new um, opportunity, uh, which we, we have never seen before. So our campus is limited in capacity. We can house around 30,000, 30, but mm -hmm. by having uh, online distance learning, we can actually double that capacity by retaining uh, the current infrastructure and, and uh, we need to improve our infrastructure, obviously. So again, looking at the challenges, it has opened up new opportunities and, and we are quite agile in, in moving uh, around these challenges. And uh, we have seen now that we, we saw lots of new opportunities coming over. Uh, when we are having a conference, for example, they are only attended by 100, 200 maximum. Now right. our conferences can be attended by 400, 500. So the far-reaching impact on a pandemic has resulting in us uh, moving around the, the challenges by, by opening up new opportunities. So it is very exciting. At the same yeah. time, uh, we are opening up new doors uh, and see what, what are the things that we can uh, still venture into. Daniel? Right. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. That was uh, very insightful. And I also agree that how we can expand the scope. I'm looking at the list of people here and some are from Laos, the Philippines, you know, which if we did it just physical and we thought of it as being a venue, you know, uh, we were quite limited. Um, Professor Tani, if I can come to you next. Um, so similar in the same vein, um, what has NUS seen as its greatest challenges because of COVID-19, as well as the opportunities um, that it presents? Uh, if you could share with us some of your thoughts. Well, uh, uh, what uh, my colleagues have shared uh, quite mm -hmm. similar. Uh, we have uh, sort of activated the uh, new academic year. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to keep life as normal as possible. Of course, the safety of our community is key of our concerns, right? So we have online uh, instruction for classes that are 50 and above. Okay. For classes that are under 50, uh, we still have face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also a series of measures, right, such as uh, zoning within the university, uh, you know, to, to, to help basically mitigate any spread of the illness. On the research front, uh, we are quite 
happy that uh, we have responded pretty well. So, you know, we were the first to culture the virus. And uh, we also actually linked up a serological test to help with contact tracing. Uh, we have a vaccine under consideration. Uh, we also uh, have been working in several areas, especially point of care test kits. Uh, in fact, we have six projects on point of care test kits, which we hope to be able to uh, launch them and productize them sometime towards the end of the uh, this year. I think our major concern is really uh, the job situation right. of okay. our graduating class of 2020. Uh, and we are fortunate in this particular aspect because the government came up with this uh, job support scheme mm -hmm. that uh, provides partial support of jobs across the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, that was quite a big investment by the government. Uh, and uh, particularly, it pays 100% of the wow. salary up to about $4,600 uh, for the months where we are under the circuit breaker. That is uh, oh, wow. in April and in May, right. where everything stopped, right? Nothing moves. And uh, the uh, this has helped. And uh, the university, we have using this uh, job support scheme, uh, mm -hmm. come out with a resilience and growth uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, there are four areas. One, right. uh, it provides uh, support for students who suddenly becomes uh, financially uh, 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 challenged. Oh, yeah. Because of no, COVID? I mean, who, who, who actually go into dire uh, financial right. circumstances because of COVID-19. So we have had uh, financial aid for students. And now we are basically making the access easier and providing more support for this group of students and also the groups uh, whose uh, financial situation uh, has become very bad because of COVID-19. We have, uh, the second thing is we have provided 800 traineeships partially supported by the government and 200 jobs for our new graduates. Uh, so about a thousand positions that are available uh, for our new graduates. Uh, we have also for all graduates, uh, as well as graduates who have graduated last year as well, uh, free courses four free courses under our continuing education framework. Right. Uh, this is really to keep them occupied while they are waiting for their jobs. We expect them to wait much longer for their jobs. So we thought that it would be useful if they can equip themselves yep. with uh, new skill sets and competencies yep. by so how, how our continuing education framework. Sure. How involved was NUS as an institution in part of crafting these um, economic packages um, that the government announced? Just wanted to know the, the level of involvement. Uh, well, the government actually had their ministerial task force to create that. And mm -hmm. this was mainly uh, done by the Ministry of Finance. Okay. Uh, I think for the first time, I think our government has actually put out a tremendous amount of their reserves right, to help Singapore as a whole. Right. And the key, key, key thing is really how to sustain jobs, how to keep jobs. Then the last thing which uh, we did was to come up with uh, an innovation challenge, which uh, we encourage our students, our graduates, if they have not had a job, mm -hmm. uh, to consider using their time to help the society. So it right. comes under uh, three themes on how to uh, help a person to become a better person or right. how to be, help the society to become a better mm -hmm. society or how to make a more inclusive world. So these are innovation challenge where we would provide stipends for graduates uh, to 
they engage for about six to nine months mm -hmm. uh, while they are waiting for their jobs. So these are the four things that uh, we have actually made available to uh, the graduating class of 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that wide-ranging sharing. I think it was very interesting, of especially the government's role. Uh, just a time check. We are at 11.15. I think we've got about uh, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes left. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is we've got some questions which have been submitted by the audience. And um, what I will do is I will raise them and I will inform which panelists uh, would like, we'd like to get some thoughts on, if that's okay. Can we go to the uh, is other members of the panel okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So the first question um, is from uh, Bethel Zipangan from the Philippines. And the question is, how can we nail values so deeply to our colleagues in a way not to hurt them? Is it okay to impose strictness and reprimand them if necessary? And I think the context to this question is, of course, values differ from person to person. And sometimes, you know, we need to be very firm in adopt, adapting values. Um, who, perhaps, um, who would like to share their thoughts on this, uh, on this particular question? <laughs> Prof. Panut, would you like to? Yes. Okay, yes. yes please. It, it is, uh, I think, the uh, rather difficult thing, yeah? Uh, how we uh, affirming uh, values uh, to the uh, human resources uh, in the institution. Uh, yes. We, uh, as uh, a leader, uh, but uh, as a, a leader, uh, we have to affirm uh, the values uh, to all of the uh, university uh, members. University yes. leadership, lecturer, uh, supporting staff, student, and uh, even to the alumni. Uh, so, uh, for uh, I myself, uh, is uh, uh, UGM is focusing on uh, serving uh, a, a people, uh, responding the need of the people, uh, solving the problem of the society. Uh, so, uh, to do. Uh, so the UTM quality uh, must uh, excellent. Uh, so mm -hmm. let us working together. Uh, let us uh, doing <coughs> uh, effort together uh, to make more contribution of uh, our institution to the society, uh, to the nation. Uh, but we thought the. Uh, incentive, yeah, encouraging incentive. Uh, so it's incentive, right. <laughs> uh, It is difficult. So uh, the leader uh, should creative uh, to make uh, some activity. Uh, right. And, uh, yeah, uh, spending, okay. uh, uh, yeah, uh, incentive. <laughs> right, oh, okay, uh, that was okay. spending so, incentive. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. And uh, maybe... Uh, uh, can I add? Yes, please, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are certain uh, values that I think most universities will treasure a lot. For instance, integrity and honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, those, I think if it, you know, a faculty or staff member breaches it, we have to be very firm and have to be very tough. Right. Right. Because uh, this can uh, adversely affect the reputation of a university. For instance, uh, if you uh, plagiarize or you cheat in the research, I think you have to come in very strong, right? Or possibly even sack the person because this is something which most universities do not condone. Uh, however, if a faculty member is less innovative, mm -hmm. all right, or who only wants to cruise along, and just do enough. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the incentives will come in. Uh, normally, I think incentives are better than punishments. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And this is one area which I agree with uh, 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 Professor Pano that uh, if you can incentivize <laughs> your people towards, say, innovation, towards uh, 
building towards excellence, uh, that would be important. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Anita or Prof. Hamdi, would you like to chip in on this on these thoughts on uh, you know, the carrot or the stick approach in that kind of uh, realizing of values? Maybe some ex examples if you've got experiences in dealing with this uh, crisis. Uh, how, how do you say people management? Mm. It is first. Okay. Um, Thank you, Doctor. I think Professor Tan mentioned about values like integrity or cheating, uh, which I suppose in all universities would have their own SOP um, in terms of having disciplinary boards and so forth. Um, but talking about values, I mean, um, university values, the ones that we mentioned earlier before, and I think for every person in the university, it's very important that they are very clear with university values. Um, in addition, of course, to knowing the university's vision, mission, and university strategy. So I think values must be embraced by every person. Uh, it must be stressed the importance of the values by, to every person. Um, and this is intertwined, the values are intertwined with our core businesses of teaching, research, and so forth. And it must be embedded in day-to-day -day operations and our developmental initiatives. So I just give a example here, for example, in our promotion. So normally in promotion, you would see, you would look at that teaching and learning for example, in there would be a peer review, student feedback, um, innovation in teaching, and so forth. And in research, there'll be a number of measures that you look criteria during promotion. How many right. publications, the impact of publication, and mm -hmm. so forth. But in addition, in UBD, we also look at how the person embraces values of the university. So, for example, I mentioned people, because how we center a lot of our initiatives around people. So when we see a particular person going up for promotion, so for example, right. we look at his work or her work and see whether how much work this person has done with other people, for example, in developing junior faculties, right. um, mm -hmm. um, academic leadership and so forth. That actually affects promotion. So we would bounce back that promotion um, application. Right. So, um, the dean will need to work on what particular areas the person need to work on. So values is as important as the core businesses of the university, yeah. like teaching, learning, research, innovation, enterprise, and so forth. Right. Um, so, the, but this has to be made very clear to everyone in the university, albeit staff or students. It's the same with award excellence awards. It's yeah. the same with contract renewals and so forth, right. and recruitment and so forth. So I think it's very important that they do know what they're in for. Um, oh, so mm -hmm. in this way, we ensure that people would actually embrace values. All right, thank you. So it's as much about nurture and mentorship as it is about reprimand. Um, Dr. Uh, Prof Hamdi, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, this is very related to our value-based leadership theme that we are talking mm -hmm. about today. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have see, we have seen seas of changes the global economy, innovation and changes, you know, pressure and competition and whatnot. And it is more disturbing when we see that uh, there are some reports saying that only a third of our workforce are actually working. They are the two thirds, uh, basically buying in time and uh, and putting in time, basically, and, and even some, unfortunately, going against the institution. So be, with this backdrop, values is, is becoming very important in an institution like ours. And Value actually drive behavior. Um, people do something, uh, behave in in certain way due to the values that they subscribe. For example, if we look at uh, you know a lot of stories of a burning house, the, the mother comes out and 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 realize that oh the kids is still in the burning house, the mother will actually bravely run back to save the kids, and most of the time we have to strangle her, otherwise she will be burned as well. Why is the mother acting like this? It is because she values the kids more than herself. Hence, the behavior of wanting to sacrifice herself to save the kids. So this is, this is the importance of value. And failing to uh, embed values into the workforce is very catastrophic, where people do things without proper values. And it is 
incumbent upon the university to really choose the values and ensuring the values are embedded in each staff and students alike. So this is why values is very important. Otherwise, value is just things that we put on, on the wall right. and nobody yeah. actually cares about values. You know, they don't even know what, what, what it means to them. So how do we actually internalize this value into our workforce? I think that's the, the, the issue that that's right. we, have, yes. we have to look into. And, and how these translate into behavior and eventually into performance. So we are talking about cultural issue here. Uh, we want this to be part of culture. I'll give you an example. Why people do research? <laughs> Is it because they are culturally having passion in doing research or they want to uh, get professorship? You know? So this is uh, the question. <laughs> right. After getting professorship, they don't do any more research because they're already uh, at the pinnacle of, of the career. So, so again, it goes back to values. And, and how do we make sure that this value become culture in the university? So this is a big issue and, and big, you have to really put in strategy. And most of the time, uh, we, we notice that it is not the strategy that produces performance. It's actually the, the, uh, the culture you know, uh, that, that actually has a sustainable performance. So again, uh, getting uh, transforming values into culture of, of the workforce, I think is very, very crucial. And, yes. and that's what I think the institution has to work on uh, very, uh, in a very focused manner to ensure the values are subscribed, the values are embedded and, and uh, embraced uh, by the workforce and eventually turning that into, into the good culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think that was very, very interesting to understand. Um, I like how you mentioned values, behavior, culture, performance, but it has to be internalized and it proposed both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. I'd like to move on very quickly to another question from the audience. Uh, resonates with me a little bit. Uh, and the question is, what are the efforts to promote youth participation in leadership? Um, Prof Hamdi, of course, I highlighted earlier, you were a professor at 39, uh, you know, at UM, and that was highly impressive. Um, and all, and all our speakers here obviously have started somewhere and in part, as part of their journey. So perhaps, um, and sorry, the, and the, and the question also goes, we see today that leaders look down on the youth and that has made some of the succession planning not very effective. And this is from Muhammad Arif from Malaysia. Um, Perhaps if I can get some thoughts, maybe Prof Hamdi, you can you can start with this. Uh, you can start on this uh, question yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, Daniel, it's a very interesting question. Uh, probably I'm one of the youngest here. <laughs> <If I'm, laughs> yeah, I'm not even fifty yet. Uh, so we we, I mean, I have wow. strong belief in the young because I think uh, you know at the age of fifty, like me uh, next year, I'll be going off in in what ten years time, and and the university, the institution will be. Uh, you know, handed over to to the uh, to the young ones, and they are the future of the university. They are the future of the country. Actually, if you look at it from that point of view, so therefore, investing in the in the young is is paramount important in in the case of UKM. We put lots of emphasis uh, on the young because we believe that they will be the one who will be replacing us, and 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 they'll be the torch bearer. And and if we actually um, make mistake in, in bringing in the, the wrong youngs into the system, then we are going to face lots of issues in the future. So yeah, we, we, we never look down upon the young. We put lots of emphasis. Uh, I establish a, a group of, of uh, we identify the, the potential young leaders from each faculty and institute, and we have a special session with them, special discussion with them, and put them in, in a very uh, strategic uh, position for them to get exposure and hopefully one day we rise to the occasion when, when the time comes for us to hand over the, the, the torch. So again, uh, I personally feel that, you know, we have to put lots of emphasis on the young, invest in them and ensuring them that they will be much greater than us, much better than the, the, the current uh, team and the, the current the team of leaders that we have. Hi, thank you. I suppose you're right. It's always about creating or nurturing for continuity and sustainability sustainability, and also you want to see the youth um, do better and better and better. Um, is, are there any of the panelists who would like to comment on that? Or can I move on to another question, if that's okay, because we've got quite a few to go through. Uh, members of the panel, I think we're okay to, to probably go to another question. Um, oh, Prof. Pandit, did you want to say something? Sorry, I saw you. Oh, uh, yeah, just maybe continue to the, uh, continue to oh, the okay. next question. <laughs> okay. Sure thing. So the next question is um, from a Casey boy from Melbourne, and he asks, 
how best can tertiary education uh, institutions or universities engage with the wider society to share their knowledge and to help inform public policy within their country and across ASEAN nations. And I suppose it's the role of the university in society and governance. If you could. Um, Prof. Panut, would you like to uh, okay. share some yes. on that? Thanks. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. uh, uh, I, I think the role of the uh, university in the society and also in the government, uh, it is very uh, important and through our uh, research, uh, the university uh, research uh, can uh, be used uh, for the government as the <coughs> development of the uh, of the policy. Yeah, and uh, of course in uh, UGM, a lot of uh, research uh, done by UGM uh, <coughs> influence. Uh, the uh, government uh, of uh, Indonesia. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we uh, have a lot of uh, collaboration uh, with uh, some uh, university abroad, uh, not only in uh, ASEAN, of course, uh, we have a lot of collaboration with uh, ASEAN uh, University uh, mm -hmm. to do research together. And uh, I, I think uh, some of the uh, government uh, uh, consider uh, the uh, research done by the university uh, to uh, develop and uh, make the uh, policy of the, uh, the of the government. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, it is uh, very big the role of the university uh, in direct make or uh, give the direction uh, for the government policy. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And of course, earlier you mentioned about um, the research uh, from the bio, the medical side uh, contributing. Um, Prof Tan, would you like to add in a little bit about that? Because you also commented earlier on the role um, that you've played with the government uh, to craft policies, especially during these COVID times. Yeah. Well, uh, th this, this is actually a very broad question. And yes. we can spend a lot of time talking about it. But... Um, uh, Let's say that I think engagement with uh, governments, uh, I think it is important because universities have tremendous expertise, but uh, we need to have our voice and our views, especially based on our expertise heard by the government. Uh, and, and you'll find that um, Sometimes uh, this may not even work in the most developed country. Uh, right. Take COVID-19 as, as an example, uh, where the evidence from science is so stuck, right? yet uh, some very developed countries uh, decided uh, to basically ignore the, the uh evidence presented by science. I don't have to name the country. I think you, <laughs> you, you, all of us know which country uh, does that. Uh, but it's also fortunate that in many of our countries, uh, the public actually have a better appreciation of science, right? But uh, it is onus on the universities too, to be able to convey science in a way that it is understandable to the general public. Yep, true. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so I'm very happy so, that, for instance, at the mm -hmm. start of the campaign, we use cartoons to really okay. uh, illustrate, you know, where the dangers for COVID-19, how to prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So right. universities have to think about, it's not just engaging the government, if you're engaging the society, you have to know uh, the society has a very broad spectrum of uh, people and how we can effectively connect with them. Uh, you have to use different uh, mechanisms. Yeah. And what does NUS do in order to achieve that? So both in engaging with the society as well as um, the government. Yeah. Do you uh, have like government it, it, relations, it, it, people, etc.? Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. So like I, I've said, uh, it is not an easy problem. Uh, it's always work in progress. Mm -hmm. we, we hope that we can do better. And each time we learn 
how to do better. Uh, uh, we, we know, for instance, cartoons are very effective. Uh, short messages are very effective. Uh, you don't want to write a 20-page uh, paper and expecting the public to read it. That's very tough. Sure. Right? And we notice that, for instance, um, the way in which our World Economic Forum sort of uh, flesh out some of the key ideas, that to be quite an effective way to engage a group uh, of people, not all, but a group of people. So we, we are constantly trying to find out what better way to reach out to these people. And every society is very different. All right, it will be different in Indonesia, it will be different in Malaysia, it will be different in Brunei, it's different in Singapore. So we universities can, I think we do have the depth of resources and uh, we know how to assess it. Now let me sort of present another issue which sure. I think will be extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, that's social media. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, social media presents tremendous ch challenge not just to Singapore, but to the entire society, the, to the entire world. Right. And social media tend to manifest what are echo chambers. In the sense yep. that you read something, the AI drivers behind social media will keep on sending the same thing that you read. Mm -hmm. Hear something and you like it, they will keep sending all you everything. So you can perpetually be living in your echo chamber. That's right. And your views of the world or just the immediate world outside of you can be very different and can be very extreme too. I think that's a danger. So how can universities play a role? Yep. Especially to the younger people. We know the younger people our Generation X and Generation Y, the millennials, they are the ones who are very exposed to social media, much more than many of us here. All right, And uh, engaging them, uh, you need to engage them in a different way. And you can be quite sure that if you try to engage them in social media, if you are not in their circle, you never reach them. So I think that's a big problem and a big issue. How can we basically uh, engage with the youths of the future, right? Because uh, social media, while it is a very powerful tool, it also has its disadvantages. Thank you. I agree. Yes, thank you. And, you know, being a press secretary uh, in the ministry, I have to deal with the press and social media every day, so I can very much resonate with that. Maybe, Dr. Anita, do you have any thoughts on this challenge which was highlighted by Prof Tan and, you know, what is UBD doing about it? Not just in terms of addressing the challenges, but it's also like a very important marketing tool, especially in these challenging times. Any thoughts? Well, very complex issue, as Professor Tan was saying about social media. Um, pros and cons, like you said, we leverage on social media for our promotion, for marketing. It's very quick. Um, you can just viral a message or something that you want to um, promote very, very quickly. And the coverage is amazing how it can reach a huge, you know, um, wide population very quickly. But as Professor Tan mentioned, there's also this downside about um, news or messages or videos or clips that can be quite unhealthy for the population. Uh, yep. Very difficult. Um, and I think perhaps one of the, although it won't solve, because it depends on where the social media is viral as well, is communication, um, how quickly you can step in. Um, so communication, because for example, there could be, if it is news within the university, um, once you detect this, is to quickly step in and communicate to the wider community um, with regards to saying what is actually the truth behind it. Um, and I think if it's something at the national level, um, 
is something that the government can do. And I think we did this very well with during this COVID-19 pandemic because there were so many messages, um, wrong messages circulated about um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so again, it boiled down to communication. And I think what the government did very well was that they had, um, initially we had daily updates on COVID-19 right. um, pandemic. And this was right. done um, by the Minister of Health. Um, so he would quickly correct what is right and probably put forward um, what is actually what was actually happening. Um, so we had very well. We still are having regular press conferences, not just by Minister of Health, but relevant ministers as well. So I think that helped to actually die down um, the dangers, the dangerous um, messages. Um, but I think for other things that happen on social media, especially one that is viral globally, you can't control what's happening um, overseas. So, but I think communication can be one of the powerful tools to actually help control it in a certain, um, you know, um, to a certain level. Um, so I think key is also communication and how quickly okay. we step mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, the, the, the MC has just signaled that we've got 10 minutes left. And what I will do is I've got one last question each for the panelists. Um, and it's quite diverse. So if, if you don't mind me just starting with uh, Prof. Panut first. Um, Professor, I watched online on YouTube uh, during the Wawanchara Opsi Metro TV. Mm -hmm. This was about almost one year ago. And to the question about university rankings, uh, one of the things you said was what's important is... Uh, if I may quote, visa bekerja lebih baik untuk bangsa dan negara. It's being able to work better for the country and the people. Um, nine months down the line, now that we've faced COVID, what are your thoughts on what the priorities for higher education institutions in ASEAN moving forward for the future? Uh, for the future, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, we need uh, collaboration, yeah. Uh, among the university in uh, ASEAN, a closer and strengthen and strong uh, collaboration uh, mm -hmm. among us. Uh, I want that uh, our young talent not go to the far <laughs> uh, location uh, in the world, uh, but uh, we want that the young talent from ASEAN country uh, nurturing uh, the education in uh, ASEAN region uh, and as we uh, said before that uh, we want to attract uh, young people from uh, all over the world uh, to study uh, in uh, ASEAN a country so if we can do it uh, I believe that the ASEAN uh, region uh, will be uh, developed uh, faster and also uh, with the uh, ASEAN motto, one vision, one identity, one community, let us uh, do together, uh, let us uh, make a strong collaboration uh, to develop the university uh, in uh, ASEAN. Thank you, sir. So much. Thank you very much, Prof. Panut. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Dr. Anita one more question. And the question, the question goes, um, how do you see the role of the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, as part of the ASEAN higher education uh, landscape and its importance uh, moving forward? Okay, um, there are 17 um, Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Uh, um, and I think within ASEAN, um, well, especially for UBD, they are also incorporated across the core domains of the university. Um, and I think if you were to support that, you have to ensure that it's incorporated across your core businesses or domains. That means through your teaching and learning, through your research, what you innovate, your enterprise, your internationalization, and even your governance. Um, so incorporation into your operational, but as well as your developmental initiatives. Um, so for, if I just give an example of what we do at the university, sure. our undergraduate programs are very broad-based. 
Um, they're interdisciplinary, so we'd like to nurture our students so that they can think outside their discipline and become future-ready graduates. But within our programs, there are three key principles um, that cuts across our programs. That is leadership and innovation, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, and environmental awareness. Um, so whatever programs you do, those are the three principles. So leadership, we've had a lot, a lot of talk in this. Um, it's something that we have to nurture in our students, um, especially being the main university of the country, because our students will be the future readers of the country. Um, entrepreneurship, it doesn't mean that everyone needs to become businessman or businesswoman, but it's just creating this entrepreneurial mindset that they can create nothing, uh, they, can, they can create something out of nothing or with, or with limited resources. And I think this is in one of the SDGs as well. And of course, environmental protection, uh, environmental awareness. So for example, our engineering students would be aware of the environment, for example, um, in using their materials and so forth. Um, but within our program as well, um, yeah. We have a year of mandatory year out of the university. Right. Which like is a gap year of sorts. Exactly. So it's mandatory. You don't do it, you don't graduate. Um, so it's part of the curriculum. So but we allow students to have a choice, whether they want to go overseas to do study abroad through student exchanges with one of our partner universities. The second one is internship oh. with industry, companies. Um, the third one is incubation. So they may be doing they may be creating their own businesses before they graduate. And right. the fourth one is substantive community outreach projects. So they work with the community, um, not just within Brunei, but also overseas. So they may be going to South Thailand, for example. We've had students going to Indonesia as well, mm -hmm. um, Cambodia and so forth. Um, some of them are teaching basic English or teaching basic computer skills or basic Malay. Um, normally, this, they, um, some would be going to underprivileged schools or schools run by volunteers or teachers paid very low wages. Uh, so those are just examples, but most of our students, about 80% of our students, leave the country. Right. Um, and they're dispersed throughout um, the world because we make sure that they are well dispersed. Um, but, other, but other initiatives that support the SDGs in our teaching and learning would include our entrepreneurship village, which services right. all students. Um, mm -hmm. We have the university startup center, which is mm -hmm. many alumni coming back. So we support them when they leave the university as well. Um, we have, for example, our center for lifelong learning, um, which continues to upskill and reskill, um, not just alumni, but the community as well. Uh, right. because they don't have to leave jobs um, okay. to go on to the farm. Um, and things like but our programs as a whole, that it's very affordable. Most students are on scholarships. Um, if not, um, there are special funds to help those um, from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, it's amazing how community can come together, especially alumni, in helping um, students. Um, so those would be just... Um, just some brief initiative under teaching and learning how we support the um, 17 SDGs. But again, sure. there are other activities as well under research as well and sure. other. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nathaniel. Nice to see that UBD has such a strong core uh, couched in the UN SDGs. Um, Prof Tan, I'd like to come to you next for the last question. And um, so the question, how the question goes is ASEAN universities have always looked up uh, to NUS in terms of its achievements, rankings being one of the indicators um, that we've discussed a little bit earlier. So I think moving forward, what role do you see NUS playing in terms of both this value-based leadership as well as what it can offer um, you know, for the ASEAN counterparts as in, in, in moving forward together? <laughs> oh. Well, thanks. Uh, this is this question which uh, I've been thinking uh, about too. Uh, and I'd like to echo Professor Panut's point that uh, there has to be greater collaborations uh, across ASEAN uh, universities. Uh, and uh, uh, 
one of the important areas is in the development uh, of uh, young faculty members, right? Because all of us know that uh, the talent and expertise of the university, uh, faculty members are very critical. So how can we uh, develop the faculty members? Uh, I do know that uh, there is quite a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, exchanges, but I think there can be more exchanges so that uh, young faculty members can be exposed uh, to uh, faculty members uh, across the whole of ASEAN. And NUS will be very pleased uh, to uh, sort of provide access to young embodying uh, ASEAN uh, faculty. Uh, you know, sometime in NUS, uh, perhaps half a year to one year, right, where they can actually interact and engage with uh, our faculty members as well, and therefore build links uh, with other ASEAN countries. I think using faculty members as sort of the link makers or the, the people who create the bridges uh, will be one important aspect uh, in order to have a more consolidated uh, region. So that's that's one. The second one is that I would encourage actually to have actually more student exchanges. And I have tr been trying to encourage. Uh, currently, a lot of our students go overseas, mm -hmm. uh, but most of them would want to go to US and Europe. They miss ASEAN, they just kind of go a bit further. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is that Look here, ASEAN is such an important region. We have a much bigger population. The potential for growth is so huge. And uh, ASEAN is just next door to Singapore. All right, why don't we look at ASEAN? So trying to encourage our students to go to ASEAN countries is something which I'm also uh, working very hard towards. So if I can have more of my students uh, either spend time to a student exchange in one of the top ASEAN universities and likewise having ASEAN faculty members spend time at respective. I think that would form a very good foundation for us to be more synergistic uh, uh, in terms of universities in the region. Uh, that, I guess, would be the first step. All right, if we can get by this first step, then I think uh, there's tremendous potential for all ASEAN universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Tan. I definitely uh, subscribe to the idea of building links as well as uh, greater mobility among students as a way to bridge uh, you know, this ASEAN community and the values. Um, and last but not least, uh, Professor Hamdi, uh, the question I have for you is, you know, you're founded at Advanced Centre on in, in Engineering as well as the IR 4.0 Centre. So what I've noticed is you're always very forward-looking, you know, about the evolution. Um, simple question, what do you foresee as the future values, uh, not just of UKM, but also of kind of like ASEAN higher education uh, as a whole? And feel free to comment on any of the earlier comments as well. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, very interesting question. Um, for me, the, uh, the ASEAN universities have got huge potential, as mentioned by my colleagues, uh, not only because of our locations and our numbers, uh, but also uh, because of culture embedded in, in ASEAN. Um, there's a huge disparity between universities uh, in each country. And um, the challenges that we are facing, particularly in, in Malaysian university, is really the, the financial strength. Uh, and, and it is a serious matter because no matter what strategies that we have put in, and no matter what plan that we have already uh, you know, uh, uh, put forward, but without the uh, financial strength, we can't really move further uh, than you know, just doing what we have. So this is the real challenge. Uh, and the pandemic has worsened this, where allocation for universities are not forthcoming, uh, not enough and not insufficient. Universities is no more a pure cost center. The uh, leadership in the university has to look beyond uh, the, the shore and we are being seen or we have to act like uh, as a profit center as well. So this, mm -hmm. 
the training that, that has been uh, received by the, the uh, vice chancellors are insufficient for the person who actually goes into being a profit center. But again, whether the person like or not, uh, the leadership of the university has to look into that because um, wanting the government, for example, to to put forward the financial help might not be uh, wise because uh, it is going to be more difficult in the future. And universities require a different skill set uh, in terms of leadership in order to really um, find ways of, of uh, uh, generating income for the university. So this is the, the greatest challenge uh, for Malaysian universities. I know uh, mm-hmm. some other countries might not be facing that, but this is a true challenge in the, in the Malaysian universities. And uh, without a proper solution, I think they, uh, it will really hamper uh, progress and and instead of looking at the excellence in academic and also research uh, we we have to kind of think thinking of uh, focusing our energy into uh, generating income for the university to sustain uh, the institution so uh, we can't move forward uh, fast fast enough if this challenges in this financial aspect is not resolved uh, quickly and amicably. Otherwise, you know, universities keep on talking about this issue uh, day in and day out without a proper solution. And it is now uh, becoming heavier to the leadership in the university uh, right. due to COVID um, because the income coming from uh, students and, and uh, other activities has really uh, shelved or, or, you know, has reduced significantly. So th- that worries me uh, as a vice chancellor because uh, my energy, again, has been divided uh, and into looking at that area where I, I would have thought that, you know, I, I should be focusing more into uh, uh, pushing for research and academic, preparing graduates for the nation and, and <laughs> looking at collaboration, bringing industry inside the universities and so on. And when the whole economy is going down, the industry might not have enough money to, uh, you know, to, to sponsor research. Government has has not enough money to 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 push uh, into universities and uh, the, the private university students are not coming over. International students are not uh, getting into the system. So all this uh, compounding uh, effect is really um, pushing the university uh, to a corner and, and, and is getting a bit worrying now. So we need to learn how, uh, to, how to you know, really come out of this conundrum. Otherwise, uh, we will be there for quite some time and, and, and we'll be in trouble. So, yeah, I, I wish to, to, to end, end my, my points there because the, the, we cannot see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and we are struggling to, 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 to move uh, within the limitation, which is actually now squeezing the university further. University wants to progress and progress means that we need you know, a lot more financial assistance from everywhere, but that's not forthcoming. So again, uh, whatever we do, either you know conforming to the SDG or, or pushing the, the the function of university for society forward, but without the proper financial strength, I think university will will be struggling. Thank you so much, Professor. In fact, I had written that down, but I didn't come to that question. So what I had wrote, written earlier was, how does one remain steadfast to the values of access and ensuring people get education? but also balance the economic motivation. Um, and thank you so much for actually uh, addressing that um, in your closing remarks. And I agree with you, these are also real challenges that we face. Being at the finance ministry, you know, we are dealing with finance day in and day out. And, and, and yes, it is a challenging time. But I believe then, I suppose, moving forward, uh, if we can collaborate, but if the values are clear, uh, God willing, we'll be able to overcome this. So once again, thank you so much. It's been a true honor and pleasure for me to host such a distinguished panel from Indonesia, Brunei, Singapore, and of course, uh, Malaysia. Um, I once again thank all of you for um, your insights. The comments on the chat box are very positive. Uh, Sorry for those who are watching and I couldn't ask your questions. Uh, Time is not on our side. Um, But, you know, if you could join me on a virtual round of applause for our uh, panelists. Uh, Of course, we can't hear you, but I'm sure everyone is clapping wherever you are. Thank you again, and I shall now return the floor to Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Latif.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Daniel Rahman. Um, an amazing educational academic session for all of us. I couldn't remember the last time we had such prominent individuals to share their um, experiences and also what they have gone through and all their success story with all of us. I would like to personally thank uh, the moderator, uh, Mr. Daniel Rahman, and also all the presidents, uh, vice chancellors and rectors, Professor Tan, Professor Hamdi, uh, Datin, Dr. Anita, and also Professor Panot for allocating this time for all of us. Um, we would like to give our thanks to ACAP uh, under the helm of Prof. Nordin for initiating this program and bringing all these um, excellent experts and leaders to share their experiences with us. Um, to the Ministry of Higher Education as well, and to University Kabangsa and Malaysia. It's also a teamwork of various departments from the International Relations Centre, the Faculty of Medicine, and also the IT Centre, who has actually uh, assisted us in realising the day. Uh, special thanks to the International Office of University Brunei Darussalam, National University of Singapore, and Universitas Gajah Mada for also uh, being able to invite and, and um, bring your presidents and uh, rectors and vice chancellors to join all of us. Now, in the ish, in the true ASEAN style of a tradition, I would have invited all of you for some refreshments or some makan session uh, right after this event. But with this new normal, sadly, we are unable to be permitted to do so. But we hope that one day we would be able to gather this spectacular group of fan, um, panelists for um, physical meet as well. Yeah. So thank you to all the panelists again um, for allocating the time for today's event and sharing your insights. But before we end today's session, we would like to commemorate the day with a virtual photo taking session, if that's possible. If all the panelists and moderators would give their biggest smile in the count of three. Um, all right. One, two, three. Okay. All right. So thank you once again. Thank you very much. Definitely a historical day to gather such four prominent individuals to all of us. Uh, specifically to all the attendees here, you know, we've seen the numbers have been growing and we're just amazing for all of you. We're just amazed with all of you staying over for two hours to, to be part of this um, important day for all of us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our CAP in collaboration with University of Bangsa and Malaysia will be organizing future webinar events and we hope to be in touch and we'll keep you posted and hope that you will join all of us again. Once again, thank you very much to the panelists, moderator, and all of you who have allocated your time. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera. Waalaikumsalam.